Hey guys, welcome to an audiobook narrator and author chat. We're back in the Cheesy Pop audiobook nook. I know it's been, it's been a little bit since we've done one of these, um, but it is great to be back. Um, and today we got a really fun one, and it is perfect for the season. Uh, we saved this one till we got into the Halloween season. Uh, so I'm going to bring in our author of Monster Melee 85, J. Dallas Brooks. Come on in. There we go. <laughs> hey, Max, how you doing? Hey, Dallas, how are you? Oh, pretty good. How are you? Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Um, welcome on in. Uh, we're going to talk about i got the, i got i got the uh ipad here so i can show it up here you probably got so i've got it right here monster melee 85. all right is that the paperback it's the paperback monster melee 85. look at that yeah. <laughs> that is little, sweet little back cover art yeah oh that's neat and you got the 85 on your shirt you're, you're all set yeah, yeah. i'm ready i'm i'm all 80s today behind me i've got you know pac-man watching over my shoulder a galaga poster and i've got a ton of things for show and tell that i can uh, oh sweet i'm gonna share throughout the uh time we talk here all right this is pretty cool okay um well let's let let's why don't we why don't we why don't we tell everybody what monster melee 85 is about a little plot summary um so they understand the the 80s connection and everything okay yeah, yeah. perfect yeah so yeah, Monster Billy 85 is about a young guy in the 80s uh, named Billy Justice. And Billy's got a problem. He's um, kind of a loner. Uh, he's not understood by his parents or his teachers. And he's also tormented by monsters that only he can see. And he's a bit of a meek character at first. Um, and Billy is really upset about it. It's not a good start to the story for Billy yeah. until he meets a mysterious sensei. And then the sensei gives him something that he never thought he could could have. And that's a, a bit of courage and the ability to actually face his monsters and fight back. And it all takes place in the 80s because that's my favorite decade. I'm a Gen Xer. I write a lot of things that take place in the 80s. I'm, I'm all 80s all the time. And for me, the 80s was, you know, childhood. That was Atari games and E-Man toys and Knight Rider. Yeah. I'm not the a little bit older Gen X where, you know, maybe they were into you know, Bon Jovi and Madonna and Michael Jackson, although it wasn't a Michael Jackson, but everybody was. Everybody <laughs> was. It wasn't, right? It was the 80s. Uh, you know, so for me, it was more about those things, you know, the toys and, and things like that. And, and yeah. I have to confess, Billy's actually about 10 or 11 years old. He's actually a little older than me. I would have been even younger than Billy uh, in 85 when he's, you know, going to arcades and, and playing with his friends and riding bikes yeah. and, and, and going through things uh, that he went through in the 80s. Uh, it was a different time. And, and I was just remarking recently that, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s, I used to talk to my grandparents and they would talk about the history of the 1940s. This is World War II. This is American history. It's world history. Yeah. These are things that were, were ancient to me in those days. And then I was sitting one day and, and looking at the cover of Monster Melee 85. And I realized that uh, this is almost as far back as World War II was uh, back in those days <laughs> so I'm, so in a way it's it's a bit of history in a way i'm trying to keep history alive yeah oh man isn't that weird to think yeah. about I, I mean like you say that i'm like oh man how do we get old i, I get a new gray every time i mention that so <laughs> yeah right <laughs> all oh. gen xers do <laughs> that's crazy to think about the 40s yeah but it's true here we are it's, it's 2022 if we, uh... but that's why we can live stream that's why we can you know talk on on youtube and zoom cool. and we can watch our shows and and you know i like listening to music like Billy couldn't just, you know, pick his favorite song and listen to it whenever he wanted, you know. Yeah. You know, now we can, right? Now so can. it's something he couldn't have fathomed, you know. It's pretty but, sweet. You know, but it really, what it comes down to is if you want to think about this book, you know, in Hollywood, what they do when you write a, a screenplay, you have to say it's a mix of, of A and B. You have to have two stories that it's a mix of, right? That's how you kind of promote it to agents and, and oh. Hollywood studios. So if this were going to be a Hollywood movie, it's a combination of Ghostbusters, and Karate Kid, that's exactly what it is, right? It is. I mean, it totally is. Like the sen like sensei is. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. It's just and, a fun story, and that's the point too. There's there's a message there of of, of overcoming your fears and 
and, and, and using the powers of imagination and, and, and not yeah. to spoil the ending, but there's a lot of, a lot of that in there. Right. But there are a lot yeah, of 80s references in there too. Oh, and, and I mean, and, yeah, you, you can clearly see how important that decade was to you. Um, and you know, me too. I was I was a little 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 nugget then too, and I uh, I I ha I can relate to a lot of the the stuff in this book too. It was it was super fun for me to narrate this. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, there's 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 books that I narrate that uh, are are a slog to get through, and this one was like, yes, I I I like could relate. It was exciting. It, it had a heart. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's, it's really neat. I think, and I think a lot of you guys, I think a lot of you guys would really like it um, that are watching now, you know, it's, it's, uh, did it, has anyone, has anyone um, in, that's watching right now read the book or listened to it? Uh, I'd love to know. If anyone actually has, because uh, I highly recommend the audio book. That's what I tell everyone, because you you nailed it. You nailed yeah. not only Billy, but Billy's friends and you know, his parents. And you brought life to the story in a way that I imagined in my head. So hearing it yeah. is always great. You know, hearing it yeah. from a professional who, who knows what they're doing is, is wonderful. So uh, it really brought life to the story. And I could almost see it, you know, when I listened to it. Oh, good. And cool. Even my like, own children are listening to it, you know, your version of it, and they, they're just enamored and they, they love it. Wow. That's cool. I mean, that's really cool to hear that yeah. your kids are, are, are loving it. I, I, um, what was that actually like for you as an author hearing, you know, my portrayal were there? I mean, you said I nailed it, but, but that's, that's cool. But like, were, were you like, oh, yeah, wow, I did. Were there any times where you're like, oh, wow, I didn't think about, about it like that, like that guy sounding like that, but that works or like, I don't know, how how is that? No, so my philosophy is to uh, master your strengths and hire your weaknesses, right? I'm not a, a, a voice actor and I'm not an actor, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And so I rely on the professionals like you to bring life to that. So I'm not like one that says, Oh, I would rather this way or that, or it should, doesn't sound, I'm just, it sounds great. So I'm all in on it. You know, if it sounds good, I'm, I'm happy. So, um, and you'll think of something better than I would when it comes to a tweak or a, a change or an accent, you yeah. did surprise me with, you know, with the accents and things. I didn't even anticipate that you would do accents that well. And it, it, it worked really well in the story in my head. When I wrote it, I could hear it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I read it out loud to my kids just to do a, a sanity check. I always read it out loud before I, you know, finished the, you know, the copy. And you know, I didn't really do the accents. I read it just in my voice. It sounds just like this. And, and they were engaged, but when you did it, they have their headphones on and they're listening on, you know, on the phone, on the audible app. And they're just, they're in another world, you know? So oh. I really appreciate that. You know, so good. I highly All recommend right. it. I highly That's recommend good. it. My, my accents were good. Woo. Yep, everything was great. That's <laughs> accents are tough, you know? Yeah, um, they can be. And and you know when I'm narrating something and I'm switching back and forth between like a guy with an accent and then a, another guy without one and the narration text. <laughs> yeah, I, I take on many personalities during these recordings. And it's like that's how it is when you write them. I'm the same way. Is it? Sometimes, okay. sometimes they write themselves. Sometimes the characters do things. So you know, with, with this story, um, there's a chapter very early on, and and the first thing that came to me was was Billy. Uh, in the karate studio, uh, thinking he's lost, thinking there's there's nothing to be done, and, and he's just going to be tormented. And then a sensei sees what he sees and empathizes with him, and that yep. surprises him to the point that he says, "Wow!" And that's why that's part of the uh, the sample. So if you want to listen to the sample to oh, know yeah. what the book's about, that's early in the book. But that uh -huh. sample, that that sample audio clip is the first thing that came to my mind. That was the scene. And from that, we built out, you know, the story about Billy and, and you know, and, and it said the eighties because that, you know, that was my childhood. And I, I think that's part of, of the appeal, but also what I wanted to do was take my, my two younger kids, they're, they're 10 and 12. So they're around Billy and Clara's age. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to take them on a walk through the eighties. We always talk about that. It'd be such a wonderful thing to do. Now we'll watch old clips of He-Man or Garfield we just watched the Garfield Halloween adventure, right? You got to do that every year. It's a tradition, right? Whoa. We watch old 80s commercials and listen to 80s music. You know, they're, they're 
they're really in tune with 80s culture, right? My kids are really unique in that regard. This was a way to take them on a walk through the 80s and that's cool. kind of experience it. And that, that's why I included things like, you know, in, in 1985, when I was in kindergarten, I, I vividly remember in our time, the Titanic was a big mystery. You know, it had sunk, mm-hmm. but we didn't know exactly what happened. It hit an iceberg. Where was it? It's kind of a mystery. Yeah. And in 85, uh, some explorers actually found it, you know, they went down yeah. deep and found the wreckage. Right. And that was big news because it had been right. over 70 years. Right. And that yeah. played on the news and those things, you know, I remember a lot of those things. So, you know, I, I went back and researched and made sure the dates and, and, and times are correct. And, and the way the reporting was done was correct. But the things that Billy would have seen on the television yep. are things that really we saw on television. Those are real historic events. Yeah. And it had an impact. You know, I remember it being kind of a spooky feeling to me. And right. somebody like Billy, who's kind of scared of monsters anyway, he just imagines, hey, what what lurks down in the ocean? You know, to him at that point in his in the story arc, he's uh, you know, he's a little nervous about it, you know. And that's but, but see, like that's a, a great example of um something you do really well, which is tying, you know, the, weaving these real life events that actually happened uh, into this, you yeah. know, fantasy story. And um uh, it's really neat. I mean, from from like you know, from the get go of this book, it, it just like, boom, you know where you are that time <laughs> in history, yeah. you just feel it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's neat. I see uh, um, Naomi, Naomi's listening right now. This is cool. So Naomi's a third of the way through. Oh, sweet. Love awesome, it. Naomi. Thank you for reading or um, listening. She, uh, oh, reminded you of Miyagi. <laughs> <laughs> cool okay yeah <laughs> so that was the karate kid was a big influence i have to admit you know yeah um that's that's cool okay um I'll admit, we could all um, use a mr miyagi in our lives anyway i mean who i mean yeah how um julie oh she's a question for me how do i how do you keep track of the different voices you use when you narrate a book oh that's a good that's a good question julie so um uh, first, I actually I read the book, um, and I will make like a list of all the characters in my notes. And uh, every time, and then when it, I'll make little notes about each character so I can kind of formulate what they sound like. And then um, when it comes time to recording it, uh, every time that character comes up, um, a new character comes up, I'll record it. And so. I have a reference point to go back if like that character is in chapter five and then they're not there till chapter 20. I, I have it there. That's hmm. so that's how I do it. I keep it all in my um, I keep it all in here. Like uh, I'll I'll just go to my voice memos and it'll say like Billy and I'll have like two sentences from him. Hmm. And uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's, that's how I keep it. track because <laughs> there's a lot to it. No, it's not easy. I, so I've recorded uh, just nonfiction, uh, you know, my own using a mic and, and doing it. And it, there's no characters, just me kind of reading what happened. It's a yeah. historical biography. And it was more work than anything else I've done. I mean, writing it was nothing. Having to record and go back and fix the oh, errors yeah. and, and the pauses and the ums and uhs and the coughs and, you know, and, and it doesn't sound right. And of course, I'm sure I mispronounce it. That's that's the worst thing. I mispronounce a word, you know, and they're yeah. like, oh, it's a- no, it's out there. It's a crazy, yeah. I, I mean, it's a yeah. It's a crazy thing that I do. There are, there are a lot of listeners though, so I, I have to admit, a lot of people really enjoy Good. audiobooks today. You know, whether it's on the commute or on the school yeah. bus or are just you know walking out in the it's, yard or doing housework even. I mean, people listen to books. They do. It's really Great. cool. I love that. Yeah, that we can do this now for yeah. people. It's so accessible. Um, it's really neat. I see uh, Elizabeth. Oh, hey, Elizabeth and Mark. It's good to see you guys here. They're two of my uh, voiceover uh, clients. I do voiceover coaching. Awesome. And so we've got two of them right here. This is great. Um, yeah. Hey, guys. Good to see you here. Um, yeah. So I, I, uh, I, you know, I think uh, obviously the current 80s show is, is Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, like, have you gotten... Have people talked about Stranger Things with you and this book and like how, you know? Yeah, I'm a fan of Stranger Things, first yeah. of all. We all are, the whole family, uh, yeah. you know, we, we I mean, love awesome. watching it. Yeah. And, you know, when you think of Monster Melee 85, it's 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 kind of like Stranger Things, but 
but kid friendly. All right. This is middle grade. Yeah. So I wrote it for eight to, you know, 12, but you could be, you could be 22 or 32. Even I wrote this so that moms and dads or grandparents or, or caregivers or babysitters or anybody yeah. could enjoy following the story yep. along with the, the target audience, which is, you know, the middle grade reader. Um, but the 80s stuff is pretty interesting. I think it's become more fashionable for our generation, for Gen X and, and, and some of the probably the, the older millennials uh, who remember the 80s. Uh, you know, it's, it's nostalgia. But yeah. just like the 40s to me, I, I love the 40s and 50s. I love that decade. I didn't experience it. Never, never sat there and listened to Elvis play live or right. in a, a new, you know, new uh, Chevy back in the, in the 50s when they were long boat cars. Right. But yeah, they yeah. looked beautiful. They you know, had great style. And I like the uh, I like the era and I liked reading about it and learning about it and, um, you know, kind of experiencing it through movies and, and, and television and music. Totally. And so that's that's kind of what uh, what I think is happening now. I think the 80s are a different time. And, and, and really, you know, before, you know, you know, the pandemic and, and then people kind of being secluded from one another and, and kind of stuck, you know, thinking back of an earlier time before all that, it, it's appealing to people, you know, especially you know, adults to think of your childhood. And I, and I think for children to imagine a, a different world, uh, you know, often my kids, you know, they play 80s video games with me. So we have, uh, uh, you know, Nintendos and Ataris and things. And, awesome. and uh, you know, for example, I grew up, here's the, here's the funny thing, the, the games in the 80s were a little bit different. Yeah. So two player really meant at that time that Somebody was getting on their bike to go to somebody's house to play two player, right? You had to be side by side. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes, there was no exactly. online gameplay internet, you know. <laughs> you know, in a way that's probably less convenient, right? We, you know, if we had to go back to the '80s for too long, we might get bored with that, right? We want to get online and just make it a little more convenient, right? <laughs> but back then, that's that's how it was, and so it was a, it was a different thing, you know. Yeah. And we couldn't imagine the conveniences, of, you know, of today back then, you know, in, right. in ways that you know, technology that we didn't even think about is here, and it lets us relive those days it does, it's, it's it does. amazing and then in the future it'll be something different you know and, completely I, different i mean geez i'm scared what <laughs> you, know, you know there's a lot of a lot of young people don't remember so in in 85 that was the year that uh nintendo the nes really hit the market right so let me let me share one of my prized possessions here oh um, there it is this is a real nes nintendo an 8-bit gaming system i had that too I had that too. Pretty big, right? And the games on this, Love this. blew our minds, right? That was yeah. amazing. And I spent so many hours bleary eyed, you know, my eyes would turn red playing Super Mario Brothers and yeah. Super Mario 3 was Super one. Mario, of my Legend of Zelda. Zelda's a great one. I've got all those games as well. Wow. But what Billy plays, so here's here's the thing. Let me show you an emulator. This is a yeah, this he, is an Atari, this is an Atari 2600 emulator. Okay. You see the wood grain panels, right? Yeah. Now, the real Atari 2600 was a little bit bigger, but it was really one of the first home consoles that people took home that... and played video games at home. The thing is, so cool. when you looked at a video game on the Atari 2600, you were glad to have it. It was great. You know, you could play games at home. That was a new thing. There were others like ColecoVision and, and some other things, mm -hmm. but to have that Atari meant you could do things at home that you, you used to have to go to the arcade to do. But right. the graphics were quite different. They weren't quite arcade quality. And so th there was actual scene in here where Billy and his older brother are debating this. And his older brother is uh, mistakenly, he's always wrong in his predictions, but he says, you know, <laughs> people won't play home games in the future. It's all arcade. That's where the cool kids play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the 2600 wasn't my first console. Oh, and really? So Billy's first console is my first console. Oh, the okay. I wrote it. His first console was the Atari 5200. But the Atari 5200 had the distinction of coming out in late 1982. So its sales were all about 1983. And if anybody has followed video game history, you know that 1983 was the video game crash year. So sales plummeted. Everybody thought video games were over. There were yeah, no right. more sales of video games. So there's very few of these today. I'm going to share with you That's... how big this one is. Oh, my. This God. is what an Atari 5200 looks like. And I have to say, this isn't an Atari 5200 for me. This is the Atari 5200. My grandmother owned this one. Oh my! And it was my grandmother who got me into gaming in the early I... 80s. She had this in 1983, this very console. That is amazing. It still works. It's no, huge. It's huge. 
That is Speaking enormous. Than a VCR? See, yeah, see, like I gotta tell, I gotta, um, I'm gonna text my brothers after this because they're older than me, and so they, I know that they played on Atari, and I don't, I gotta ask them what. What? Odds are it was a 2600 because that's what most people have. It's got to be. 52 was very short lived, but look yeah, at this controller. Look at this. <laughs> now, this, is, this is classic to me. I love it, but it is the worst design controller in the world. How do you hold that? You hold it, flatten your palm, play games like that. And then this is oh, the, usually oh, the shooting oh, buttons, right? Right. The numeric, right. the numeric pads were, you know, for special codes and things for certain games. No one used those. But, oh, yeah, pretty cumbersome. Right. Not a not a great design for a controller, but lots of fun. Um, wow, that is really neat. I'm just looking at the uh, chat here. I see uh, your friend Sue. Your friend had Pong. Oh yeah, we thought it was incredible. Oh, yeah. Pong. yeah. See, right. and it's such a simple game. I mean, a, a pixel bouncing back and forth, <laughs> and it was it was fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's amazing stuff. It is, but all of this stuff, like it, it finds its way in the book, which is so neat. And it, it does. It, it, yeah. I pay, I pay homage to the 80s. I pay homage to some of my heroes like uh, like David Hasselhoff. And the end of the book, in the end of the book, right? If, anybody, if anybody's watching, you should know who this guy is, right? This is Kit, the Knight Industries 2000, right? Michael Knight drove this guy from 82 to 86 in the series. It's a great, it was a great live action TV in the 80s. Yeah, now, the 90s had better sitcoms. I got to give them that. The sitcoms came along yeah. in the 80s and the funny totally. stuff. And that was good in studio, but it's hard to beat those 80s uh, live action like uh, yeah. Knight Rider or Magnum P.I. or, or yeah, any of those shows. I don't, I don't really do. No, I don't, I don't make stuff like that anymore. <laughs> I, Murder, She Wrote, for example. That, there's oh, no, there's yeah. no crazy talking car in that one, but, you know, it's pretty cool, you know. So good. It really is. Like, yeah. man, Angela Lansbury. Oh, I miss her. Yeah, already. Yeah, the great. Late Angela Lansbury. She's yeah, right. a fabulous actor. Yeah. 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 She was the best, man. Hmm. I even pay homage to, you know, honestly, this is what's funny. Uh, I had, and I'm sure you did too, Max, a Blockbuster video card. Yeah. Right. I remember yeah. before Blockbuster, uh, in 85 was the year that really started to kind of take off as a national chain, right? They were what we call mom and pop video rental places. Yeah. 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 Had. And I had memberships there too, but Blockbuster, I mean, they just came in and you had, wow movies and games for days you could rent uh, i rented double dragon for my uh nes at a, at a, at a oh moment, yeah we rented right. the games rented yeah game. that's right correct mm, i remember that you used to rent vcrs because not everybody had a vcr in that day and of course i allude to that in the book as well you know they're very expensive and not all moms and dads are going to spend a whole lot of money on a vcr, VCR. Uh, so you would rent one and then rent the movie to play on it yeah, yeah, you would yeah, do yeah. that at a grocery store or a blockbuster or whatever. Uh, it's crazy yeah. how things have changed. It, it, it is. Well, you're right, though. You, you think about like your kids right now looking back at, at a time when they didn't have access to a movie right here. Yeah. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the save button on a Word document, right? It, it's, it's a three and a half inch floppy diskette. It's a little, it's not really floppy. It's actually kind of hard plastic, but it's a little yeah. square diskette where you, you, it was not, so kids today, if you're watching, it's kind of like a little thumb drive, but it didn't store very much data and it slid into your computer. This is before CD-ROMs and before DVDs, yeah, right? Yeah. But you still see that logo uh, when you save something, you know, it's the save button. But <clears throat> yeah, there are college kids today who have never seen one of those right. in real life. You know, it's just the way things are. And way about, that, is, that is so crazy to think about. I d yeah, like. Wow, that's that is insane. It's crazy because I, I did a book. Um, I recorded a book about it was uh, a fictional book set when they created the computer, basically. Okay, okay. So, so like just before this book takes place, really. So, um, and, and then you see the advancements like to where it got to here, um, and it's like, wow. Now we're here. We are now. You're just like what? But so it was this. What, before, what is, before I wrote the 85 book, I wrote one that took place in the year 2037. And okay. that was equally strange uh, to imagine what the future brings. And in yeah, that I mean, one, it was AI and it's a, it was completely okay. the opposite of the 80s. And even in that one, there's ties to the 80s because 
the grandfather in that story remembers the 80s and his, okay. you know he's, he's probably my age you know then yeah. uh, and it's just a different world you know with uh, ai and uh, machine learning and quantum computing and things that you know would make today feel like the 80s you know we're gonna um, see i guess how right you are with that one <laughs> eventually eventually you know who knows who knows right. <laughs> yeah man that's that's good. I, I just love to go back just for a little while just to just to visit the 80s even the 90s right. yeah, it'd be cool but yeah, yeah. And, and i've also imagined what would it be like for billy and, and and his friends what would they think of today yeah if they got into a time machine and appeared right here right now in 2022 and and met some of the young people who might read you know a book about them what yeah. would they think you know, I always imagine things like that, you know, I'm sure they'd be amazed. Uh, I mean, obviously they, they would have to be. I mean, it's just, yeah. It's kind video of video games. You kind yeah. Of, yeah, right. It's yeah. kind of overwhelming to step in here from, from 1985 and, and yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I wrote a novella where a, 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 a boomer who's an adult did that very thing. You know, he, yeah. he goes from 1986 to 2021 at the time. And, uh, he would like to get back desperately. He, he doesn't want to be here. It's, it's, it's neat, but he okay. doesn't, he doesn't care about the video games and things. And, and so for him, it's a different thing, you know, but for children, I think it'd be something else. I mean, I always wanted to see the future, but when I was Billy's age, the future was the year 2000. Right. Of course. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 2000. 2000. We always yeah. thought the flying cars would be here. The Jetsons. Now, we, now when you look back at videos from 2000, you're like, man, that looks bad. We, Pretty what? ancient. Yeah. Like we were watching that. It's just ancient. <laughs> whenever they show, it's insane. Like, whenever they show like highlights of baseball from like the year two thousand, it's oh, it's, it's yeah. just like what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why does that look so? Just bad? the television graphics and the audio <laughs> and, and the picture, are just different, you know. <laughs> and now we've got you know, you know, virtual reality. Uh, you know, and I enjoy that. I'm not. I'm not a, a guy who only lives in the eighties. My son. Huh has an oculus and, and i've gotten in there and what was really cool is to be in this virtual reality world yeah. it's really weird it's something i would have imagined as a child but to see it and, and i'm in a boxing game apollo yep. creed right creed rise to glory it's a it's a, a oculus game it's a video okay. game. i really mm -hmm. enjoy playing it because you're in there you're boxing it's not like mike tyson's punch out you really <laughs> throw punches and i'm standing next to ivan drago and he's looking down at me and he's throwing punches and it's really makes you nervous. You know, I'm like, wow. wow. It's like being in, you know, Rocky four, which, you know, another eighties movie, but mm -hmm. you know, it's just I loved Mike Tyson's punch out though. It was so oh, great, man. Little Mac. Yeah. That there's a story there, right? You know, little Mac could, if you were fast enough and, and, and weren't afraid, you could, you could, you could take out, you know, Mike Tyson or, or somebody much bigger. Right. Did you beat yeah. Mike Tyson? Yeah, but I couldn't go all the way through. I never got all the way through. So I had to, I beat everybody, but not at once. And I had to use oh, okay. the cheat code to get to Mike. And then, yeah, the know, cheat code. I had to use it to get to him, you know, because I couldn't beat him. Oh, after, yeah. after an hour of doing this, I couldn't beat him. So, yeah, that's right. Because you had to go through each boxer to get to him. It took a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And the, and the fingers got tired and you <laughs> develop a nice callus on the ends of your thumbs. Yeah. Now, that's a great controller. This is, so what's interesting about that one with Mike Tyson, this is the NES controller. And a lot of young people maybe have seen this, but yeah. this was the first one that had what they call, you know, the D-pad. Yeah. That D-pad there was quite an invention by N Nintendo. I, and I think they had done it on some other gaming consoles before yeah. Nintendo, but that D-pad really was an improvement over that big joystick thing that we had with, you know, with the Atari consoles. Totally. That's, and then you start yeah. seeing the D-pad everywhere. And you still see it today. I mean, it's so efficient and useful that it, it never goes away, you know. Yep. It's so cool. Man, this is fun. Reminiscing about the 80s. Oh, I love it. You guys, um, let me see what you're talking about. I don't know how I lived without being able to look up something on the internet, Julie. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> is uh Okay, I'm just, I'm just going back to look at some of these questions here. Sure, yeah, shoot. Um... Let's see, uh, Janelle said, oh, Janelle asked, how long uh, would you say it takes to write a book? Oh, oh that's a good question. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. It really depends. I, I tend to be kind of a fast writer, right? So I think of a scene and then it kind of coalesces in my mind and expands and it just gets wild and to the mm -hmm. point where I have to write it down, right? 
I don't usually write down ideas to try to save for later. Those ideas for those books won't leave me. Once that once it hits my head, like Billy in the dojo when he meets the sensei, right? That would not leave my head. And so once I sit down to write, it, it's probably like a three month process. Depends on how long the wow. book is. That's really you good. Know, yeah, yeah, it's about three months for a first draft. Uh, and, and before you publish, you're going to go back and, and write a second draft and, and then maybe a third or fourth uh, really before you have it ready for prime time. Okay. And so, you know, I would say three months for a first draft, maybe six months, you know, really tops for me. But every writer is different. Some writers take two years to write a manuscript. And, you know, and if that's a very good polished manuscript in two years, then that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, you can overdo it. You can kind of overrush it and write too quickly, um, you know, and, and rush this to get the story out there. But yeah, for me, about three to six months, I'd say. Oh. I, for a good while there, I was writing about one or two, you know, either novels or novellas about every about every year. Um, wow. give or take. That's pretty prolific. That's good. Yeah, I like to be at the keyboard, you know, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. So. Um, wow. So that's pretty good. Three to six for you. Three to six months. Um, Michelle Phoenix asked, how scary is this uh, audiobook? Um, I, you know, not too scary. I mean, there's some there's some monsters, uh, yeah. ghosts, kind of like, you know, about as scary as an episode of like Scooby Doo, maybe. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a no, great about, example. Yeah, that's a good and, example. And that can be scary for some people. So it's something to consider. There are ghosts and there are some karate fights and things. So ghost you know, fights, monsters, but like it not not. But no, not like Stranger Things scary. Oh, no. Yeah, no. This is I wrote this for my kids. So kids. I wouldn't write a book for kids that had anything I wouldn't want my kids to see. So I've written other you know novels that are, are not in the kid uh, genre, but uh, this one is. So this one I feel is pretty safe for, yeah. again, like eight to 12 year olds, I think is OK. Totally. But, but totally. again, if you're scared of ghosts and, and, and things like that, that's something to think about. You know, on the cover, I have uh, some cover art and you can see here the the skull face monster, you know, he's, he lives in the clouds and he looks down on Billy and he's got lightning bolts for eyes. And he's, you know, he's, he's kind of scary, you know, yeah. but, uh, but not too scary for Billy. No, you know, and not yeah. eventually. So, speaking of Billy, Naomi actually asked, um, is any of your personality found in Billy? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Clara too. I'll be honest. I was uh, kind of that school nerd. So when she does a, a cool science project and she talks about a voltaic pile and, and those things uh I, i'm there too and and being a little bit of a loner with billy and and kind of kind of troubled maybe uh maybe picked on a bit mm. i'm there too the only difference between me and billy is i, I didn't have a big brother to, to add to it i was the big brother and oh okay and, and, and to that regard i i wasn't the big brother that picked on anybody that's not me but you know billy partially is so is billy's mom and dad you know i'm, I'm a little bit Billy's dad and a little bit Billy's mom and um you know there's a little bit of all the characters in all of us I think cool. so maybe maybe even the skull monster maybe I've got a little skull monster in me I, I don't know you know we've all got something you know all got a little bit of everything we do. so we do but yeah we do. but Billy Billy was older than me so Billy would have been somebody I looked up to right. as a kid you know and and the fact that he could go fight those monsters and and that I would have been scared of at that time you know I would have been five years old yeah. in 85 five or six and uh you know, he's somebody I would have looked up to. So, you know, he would have been like a big brother type to me, but. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I love, look, I love this book. <laughs> um, I love, see, you know, I love a book when I like get through it. Like, you know, I got, through it. I narrated this quick. Once we, once we oh, started, yeah. um, once you like cast me oh, yeah. and we, we talked and then I was like, <laughs> yeah. I yeah, you surprised through. me. You were done in a hurry. It was great. I, was I flew through this thing, and that doesn't happen with every book. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's how you know I loved it, because man, it was uh, that was this is just it's a it's a great <laughs> read. And when you're reading, you know, when you're reading something out loud too, that's like you can kind of relate to. And then it also it's also a ton of heart. Like I said, it's fun. It's fun. It's funny. You know. Oh yeah. yeah. Really funny. Um, and, and there's a lot of action. Like there's a lot, there's, when you've got, you've got like monster fights and, uh, the, it's, it, it should read almost like a video game would play as you, as you progress through the levels. Right. I mean, there yeah. are levels to it and you're right. Yeah. You know, world eight in Mario is going to be a little more dramatic and 
than world one, right? Than stage one. So uh, this book, I, I think I kind of wrote it like that, like almost like it progresses like a video game, like an 80s video game. Like an 80s video game. Uh, exactly. Set, set in, why, why'd you pick Nebraska? So I lived in Nebraska for a while. Uh, I was stationed there at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska, when I used to work for uh, the Air Force back in the day. And my, and my family and I were there. And what we noticed about Nebraska, this was really unique. I've been to a lot of places. I've been you know, to England. I'm from Georgia. We lived in D.C. You know, we live in Colorado today, and it's great here, too. But yeah. um, in Nebraska, the trees, the fall really showed up. I mean, in October, you wow. knew it was fall in Nebraska. And then what was really unique is that, at least in our neighborhood where we where we lived at the time, just everyone did Halloween decorations. Trick or treating was an event in there, you know. So in my mind, and my kids were pretty little then. My older ones are pretty little still. And and in my mind, that that Bellevue, Nebraska, it's a real town, nice little quaint town just outside of Offutt Air Force Base, uh, just uh, south of Omaha. Uh, it's a nice town. It in my mind is like. Halloween Central. It's it's really reminds me of uh, if you ever watch Halloween Town, right? Yep. Right. It reminds me of Halloween Town or something like that, right? It cool. really did, you know, uh, especially on Halloween night. So yeah, Nebraska. I, I don't know, it just came to me and I, I went with it, you know. It made. It, I I I think I think that kind of quaint small town just <clears throat> it works. It, it works, especially in the eighties. Yeah. Uh, there's just something about uh, yeah, there really is. There's something about yeah. that. Yeah. um it just fits yeah yeah like i i yeah I, you, when you picture it in your head you're you i don't i don't know why but like when you said the thing about the trees it just it just makes sense yeah it's, yeah it really does yeah. yeah yeah that's neat okay cool i i, I wondered that you know so i always wonder things like that like what? you know with, with place yeah sometimes the places come to me i've written stories that take place uh you know where i grew up outside of atlanta um you know i've written short stories that take place in the 80s there uh i've written myself into some of these stories so there'll be characters that meet a kid that's me you know and then maybe he's a weird kid but uh you know a future writer he's going to put him in a book right but you know things like that you know yeah. uh I, that intrigues me you know location matters so the location yeah. in a story so for any future writers anybody that is a writer you know, the location or the setting is really almost a character in a, in a good fiction story. Yep. So it, it can be a character as well, just like a spaceship can be, you know, a character. And I don't mean just AI. I mean, just the location. If you think of, uh, you know, uh, you know, Star Trek, you know, the Enterprise yep. was a character, even when it wasn't talking, you know, it, it has an impact or in a scary you know, a scary movie, a haunted house is, is, is a character. You know, we watched, yeah. we watched the haunted mansion recently, with Eddie Murphy's depiction. Right. <laughs> and it's really neat to see how that compares to the Disney uh, ride. Right. You know, I remember that yeah. when I was a kid, I went to Disney world as a, as a young guy. Yeah. It was really, really, really scary at that time for me. Um, but it's a character. The locations really matter. So it is it's kind it of is. neat. It's so true. Um, any other questions? um any other questions before we wrap it up here guys uh we have we have one here um also i'm gonna pop in the link again to the audiobook right there awesome uh, yeah <clears throat> naomi asked what made you become a writer you know that's a good question i've when i was a child i would try to write stories um i wrote a book in 1990 about me going into the future to the year 2020 to some future world dystopian nightmare of a 2020 and i have a copy of this book and i, and I can share it someday i hand wrote it and I drew oh. the pictures and it was you know smog and pollution but what i put in that book is that everybody had to wear masks in the 2020. oh come on and uh but for me it, you know, it was kind of like a pollution thing you know but uh it was really weird i looked at that in 2020 i was like oh here's an old book and i just said wow so the writing bug has always been with me um, <laughs> You got, any other, maybe, you got any other ominous predictions? No, I'm going to stop with that. I'm not like this. I don't write for the Simpsons, so I'm not going to predict anything. Else. I'm, I'm good. But actually, no, I'll, I'll keep that to myself. Well, I should talk to Elon Musk because there's one thing I think won't work out well if my writing's accurate. But, uh, you know, that's that's a different story. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, being a writer is about like creating new worlds. And, and sometimes I think it's just like maybe just being a little bored with the with the real world. You want to create something exciting and new, right? Or just, just yeah. take a walk on another planet or in another time, like the 80s or, or another, another galaxy. 
or live another life and experience something that's different, you know, than what you could experience, you know? Uh, so I enjoy that. And I enjoy telling a story that brings people a bit of joy in, in their lives. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the goal really. You want to write and have people kind of just get some enjoyment out of it. You did, yeah. Hey, you gave me joy doing this. So it's well, pretty I appreciate cool. it. Yeah. I really appreciate you doing it. Yeah. Um, to, uh, I got one more question here from Elizabeth. Sure. Um, you don't seem like you get writer's block, but in case you do, how do you tackle it? Oh, look at that question. Okay. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I've never had writer's block per se. Um, you know, I always have about four or five ideas. My ideas are like monsters standing in the doorway and, and there's too many of them. They, they can't get through the doorway. So <laughs> I can't good. decide that, sometimes writers. which one. <laughs> sometimes writer. I don't know which one to write. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the so thing. So, so what I'll do... Is, is pick one or sometimes I'll write even a short story. So if you have writer's block and you're working on something, maybe take a break and work on something else or write a short story. Or even I found that even writing sometimes like a nonfiction, you know, biographical sketch of, a, of somebody that I'm interested in learning about. Uh, sometimes that gets the juices flowing in a, in a way you don't think about yeah. it. Um, and I've done that. I've written, you know, I have a, a compilation of, uh, historical biographies um with people like uh gene roddenberry you know who, who wrote star trek and yeah and so things like that get me kind of going and then i'll leave that and come right back you know the, the main thing is to kind of keep it going keep the fingers moving on the keyboard um no the matter what you're doing if you're stuck on that thing that's okay maybe do something different just keep those fingers moving because the muse you know if there is a such thing you know the muse likes to see you busy the muse wants to know that you put uh, in that yeah. word before the muse will come over yeah. there and hop on your shoulder and say, okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. That's a good, I love it. That's a good place to, uh, it's a good place to wrap it up there. Awesome. That's sweet. Um, oh yeah. Tom here just said 2023, all is great in the world. I just need him to say that. 2023, <laughs> all is great in the world. All right. There you go. <laughs> Dallas said odds it, are we're gonna be all right yeah we're good we're good <laughs> um that was awesome this was fun this was super fun just going down memory lane memory lane like this and uh because a lot, a lot of this stuff I I you know like I said I was playing Mike Tyson's punch out you know <laughs> so um great memory yeah this was this was really fun. yeah me too likewise I appreciate it uh guys go go get the book the link is uh there in the chat uh i'm also gonna I'll, I'll add it to the description of this video uh and the video will stay up forever so, <laughs> so i'll get the video to you too dallas awesome um, yeah i appreciate that check it out if you ever want to watch this back um awesome thanks guys for watching dallas a pleasure um max thank you so much for doing this i had fun yeah. here and thanks for narrating my books and thanks for all the questions everybody yeah, you guys are great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.